Hello and welcome back. Today we'll be looking at the development of colonial regions as climate, soil conditions, and other natural resources shaped regional economic development and also how political life took root in the colonies and how slavery reshaped European and African life in the Americas. Questions to keep in mind during this portion. How did the economic activity reflect the geography and the European origins of their settlers? Why was slavery being used? And how did slavery influence the European and African life in the colonies? In 1750, the land claims in North America were dominated by three foreign nations. In green would be the English settlement. In pink, you would see the French settlement. And orange would be the Spanish. Now notice the yellow off to the west. That was called disputed territory. Everybody claimed it, but nobody was willing to fight for it. When it came to the British settlement patterns, the British settled in New England, which was Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The middle colonies, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware, and then there were the southern colonies, which included Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. Economic and social and political institutions developed in ways that affected by motivations of climate, the soil conditions, and other natural resources. We'll start by looking at the New England colonies. New England was dominated by shipbuilding, fishing, and lumbering. This makes a lot of sense because, well, they had a lot of lumber there, a long coastline for fishing, and of course a great place to build ships. Small-scale subsistence farming. Now subsistence means growing only enough to survive, and therefore they had to grow on a small scale. Why would they do this? The soil was very rocky. The growing season was very short. Eventually, they developed manufacturing, utilizing the power of the river as a source of power for a factory. The Puritan values of hard work and thrift helped New England to survive and thrive. Again, the poor soil, the fast rivers, the short seasons, the natural harbors, the long coast, dictated this type of economy. The Puritans, like most of those early settlers, were going to take what was available, use it for their best gain. When it came to New England's social structure, we've already mentioned that New England was settled by the Puritans who sought freedom from religious persecution. And therefore, their society was going to be based on religious standing. The higher you were in the church community, the higher you were in the community. The Puritans were intolerant. They did not like people who did not agree with them, and they certainly did not, did not like those who dissented, that is, opposed their religious beliefs. They became increasingly intolerant, who challenged those beliefs that there should be a same church and government and those who wanted a separation of church and state. Rhode Island was founded by dissenters, those who wanted separation of church and state, who did not think that the church should be the dominant role in the government. Many dissenters opposed this combining of the church and the government and felt there was a better way. When it came to New England's political life, we have already mentioned that they utilized a direct democracy. That is, all recognized citizens voted directly on all issues. Town meetings were where the members could voice their opinion, cast their votes, and make decisions for the entire colony. You might remember from your world history class that this is modeled after the Athenian form of direct democracy. When it came to the, mi the middle colonies, they were a little bit different. You'll notice, though, their economy was somewhat similar. Shipbuilding, 
though they use small scale farming, having slightly better soil, a slightly longer growing season, and they engage in a great deal of trade. In fact, large cities such as New York and Philadelphia begin to grow as seaports and commercial centers. Home to multiple religious groups, they generally believed in religious tolerance. Therefore, they had a more flexible social structure. They included different types of religions, such as the Quakers, Jews, Presbyterians, and the Huguenots, all could find home in the Middle Colonies. When it came to political life in the Middle Colonies, they incorporated a number of democratic principles, including representative democracy and also an insistence on the rights of Englishmen. When it came to Virginia and the South, remember Jamestown founded in 1607 as the first permanent English settlement, the southern economy in the eastern coastal lowlands, they were based on large plantations that grew cash crops. Now, a cash crop is a crop that's grown not for immediate consumption, but grown to trade for cash. Tobacco was the largest of these cash crops, but also indigo and even rice. Farther inland, though, the economy was based on small-scale subsistence farming, hunting and trading with the Indians. Notice that the further inland we go up into the mountains, the more like the New England colonies the South became. When it came to Southern society, the social structures was based on family status and ownership of land. The reason that the South was founded, again, primarily economic opportunity. So here it only makes sense that money makes the difference. Large landowners dominated the colonial government. They maintained an allegiance to the Church of England or the Anglican Church. But further inland, society was characterized by these small subsistence farmers trying to eke out a living and cooperate and get along as best they could. The indentured servants. We've mentioned that these were people who were hired, their passage paid across the Atlantic to work on a plantation for a series of, of years before they would be freed and get a piece of land for themselves. The growth of the plantation-based agriculture required cheap labor on a large scale. And these indentured servants became the first and primary use. So these early needs were met by these indentured servants. Again, we are going to get the cheap labor and also populate the colony. However, the plantation labor needs later needed to be filled by slaves. The vast amount of labor required to run a tobacco, a sugar, an indigo, or a rice plantation could not be filled by the indentured servants. And the southern colonies turned to the African slave trade. The forcible importation uh, of these Africans filled that void. Over time, larger and larger numbers came to the New World, especially here in the South. They were forcibly brought to the colonies through what was called the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is the part of the journey from Africa to the New World. They developed the slave-based agricultural economy, and that would ultimately lead to conflict which I know we've already learned a little bit about in your past years in school, the Civil War. Here's a map that shows the African slave trade. Notice where the slaves are coming from. Notice where they are going. Notice the size of the arrows. As you can see, the vast numbers of Africans that were brought to forcible importation to Brazil, to the Spanish Americas, to the West Indies, and even to British North America, absolutely staggering. The African slave trade and the development of the slave labor system in many of the colonies resulted from plantation economies 
and labor shortages. When it came to political life in the South, large planter class dominated the governing process. That is, those with the money had the power. The ideas of representative democracy were utilized through the House of Burgesses as well as the representative governments of the Carolinas, Georgia, and Maryland. They maintained close ties with Britain, still holding on to the Anglican Church as their primary source of worship and were the slowest to come around to wanting to separate from Britain. The Great Awakening was a religious movement. This was going on during this colonial period, not just in the United States or the European colonies, but also back in Europe. It led to the rapid growth of evangelical religions. We begin to get new religions springing up, new religions that began to question the old ways and sought to spread their own ideas about the relationship between people and their God. Now this is going to lay some of the social foundations for the American Revolution. Not only are women going to be able to take a greater role in religion, but people begin to question. And if we begin to question our relationship with our religion, with our God, it's not going to be long before we question our relationship with our government. Across all of the colonies, while they developed into several, into three distinct different regions, there were certain ideas that we find in New England, in the middle, in the south. No matter where you went in the colonies, there seemed to be a strong belief in private property and free enterprise. We were here to make a buck or two. Each colony had some form of self-government. This made sense to us. Why should we go back and check in with England every time we needed something done? Far better for us to simply take care of the matter here ourselves. And as long as we're making a profit, mother country should be happy. There was a general dislike for the mercantile system. That is the system that required the colonies to trade only with England. While these rules were on the books, we didn't follow them very well. Yes, we traded most of our stuff with Mother England, but we weren't afraid to try to smuggle a little bit with the French, with the Dutch, with the Spanish. As long as we were making money, Mother Country was happy, but we didn't like to follow their strict rules. And there was a general belief in individual rights. We came here as Englishmen. We should be respected as Englishmen. And this strong belief in individual rights is going to be put to the test. We're going to talk about that in our next section when we talk about the political ideas that are going to lead to American resistance and eventual independence.